So first up, we're gonna we're gonna sit down because it's it's gonna be a bit of a chat for sort of ten or so minutes. Where's the fireplace? The fireplace. Do we have hot chocolate. Uh, we have wine. I mean, that's better than chocolate in my Champagne. world. No. Champagne wine. Although it's kind of a hot chocolate day with the hailstorm. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So Hillary, tell everybody who you work for, what the business does, and what your role at the company is. Absolutely. You didn't say my full name. You just said Hillary. I know, but we've been chatting for so long now. We're best <laughs> friends. Yeah, okay. So my name is Hillary Farachi de Villa Foresta. I'm By the, the way, she did that because she knows I can't say it. <laughs> Everyone at Worf calls me uh, Fluffy. Instead of FD fee, I'm like, just call me Fluffy. It's okay. So I'm <laughs> the director it. of alliances at Data IQ. And how many of you have heard of Data IQ before? Yeah. I was going to expect quite good. a lot of hands. Okay, enterprise, um, enterprise for AI. Uh, if you think of data IQ, you think about AI, it's, such a, it's a big word. There are so many people that come uh, to the, the, the booth when we're at a show, I need to do AI. Okay, let's talk about what you really need to do in your day. So uh, data IQ is an end-to-end -end platform, ideally for enterprises, that really allows um, individuals of every technical capability from coders that never get out of the back room to management to be able to uh, engage in AI projects um, from production to modeling, from modeling through to production to um, to work on projects that really um, accelerate the business, fraud detection, um, oh, actually across industries. Um, so I manage the Microsoft Alliance and work with Dataiq globally to help us get to, get to that one-to-many platform with Dataiq. So hopefully that's kind of all over the place. But cool. So I think I would have failed if I was in the elevator with. Yeah, we would. We were talking earlier, and uh, one of the founders said to Hillary, "You start, be short and sharp, succinct. You've got to be able to do the elevator pitch." So, fail? No, I think you did fine. No, did it was fine, a champagne. Right? Yeah, success. success. Fun, right? So, <laughs> Data IQ is the seed or Series C. $101 million yeah. just closed in December. Absolutely. That's a lot of money. That we're just starting. But this is interesting, <laughs> right? So a lot of founders, particularly when they first start out, think, I've got my seed funding, I've got my Series A, I'm on the way. You guys are obviously now a scaling company, rapidly scaling. $100 million sounds like a lot. But actually when you're scaling, because you're in multiple countries as well, right? Absolutely. It doesn't go very far, does it? No, not at all. So what does $100 million give you that you wouldn't have been able to do without that? cash injection? Validation and a baseline, I would say. So, um, and, and I think of, I come from the Bay Area, from Silicon Valley. So I'm used to hearing 500 million, 1 billion, 2 billion. So when I hear 100 million, I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, what do you want to do with that? Buy socks? <laughs> <laughs> but in all actuality- some fancy socks you're buying. <laughs> Um, in all reality, it really provides a foundation, and I'm, I'm really honored to work with uh, the leadership team and the founders here. They really understand what it takes to grow a business from the ground up with virtually nothing, with self-funding, and I think the first round was like 46 million, which I think in, in the French tech or startup community is a significant amount. So getting to 101 million kind of gets gets our name on the board, but more importantly, behind that allows the company to really think strategically about where they want to go and hire uh, hire the right people, hire the teams, and it's been really great to see how they invest it uh, and, and, and really invest in the people. I'm going to ask you offline about the 101 million. Who put the 1 million in? We'll talk about that later. Founder's um, sense of humor? Founder's sense. I, I I'll take look. that 1 million. <laughs> of course, you're always going to take it. It's just the <laughs> randomness of 101. I love it. Um, you are not one of the founders, right? No. So you joined as one of the you know, sort of senior hires. What, what brought you into the vision of somebody else's company? So um, I'm not going to date myself. However, I have been in tech since 97, and I spent 14 years with HPE and um, four years with NetApp, uh, six years with VMware, and a few years with Splunk, primarily in alliances. And I think one of the my most favorite roles was at HP managing the VMware OEM Alliance. And while I was there also working on other alliances like Veeam, and I really liked that um, working in alliances kind of allowed me to manage a business within an organization. And as I looked at that, I thought, well, what do I want to bring to the table? What do I want to do? 
And I actually spoke with one of my coaches, which Pearl of Wisdom, I think it's good to have coaches for careers. Um, uh, that person said, well, what's missing is startup. On You've br brought a lot of smaller companies into larger companies. You understand scope and span. But why don't you take some time and, and go work for a startup and understand how a startup works um, and, and focuses on driving, driving growth. So that kind of prompted me to look outside of the box and working for a larger organization. How I ended up at DataIQ is a completely different story, a fun one. We'll keep going. Keep going. How long do we have? Uh, well, I'm going to keep Anthony you know, sort of honest here, and he's going to be our coach. So we've got, we've got plenty of time. You've got plenty of time? Go okay, for it. So I am, my mother's French. Uh, I married a French man. She was very excited about that. Um, and <laughs> and I set myself up in um, tech, as I think many of you know, it, it can be a burnout. There, are, I've seen a lot of people around me, for whatever reason, are not burnout. out. And I didn't want to do that, and I, I thought, what, is it, what does it need to take for me to be really balanced? And I figured that out, and every seven years, I take a year off. So that seven years is about the time um, that we needed to make a decision, marriage-wise, to be in the U.S. or France. And of course, my mother and my husband, France. And I said, OK, I'm going to France. So I was going to take that year off. And um, I have, that's another story, horses and a ranch in California. And I'm out, and I'm busy, and I'm in the Bay Area. So I, I come over without a job and my horses into a 50 square meter apartment in Paris. My husband's like, you are intolerable. <laughs> Get a job. So funny enough, I was, <laughs> I, was I love busy. that. So um, I can just imagine you so pottering around this small space king. I don't know what to do. I don't yeah, know what to do. What do I do with myself? Oh my gosh, I need my horse perfume. <laughs> so um, I was on Glassdoor. I actually really like Glassdoor. They're pretty accurate with their um, descriptions. And I see this little company with a bird. I'm like, what is that? I start looking into the space. I'm like, wow, this is a space that really interests me. Um, hmm. Let me check it out. And they had a, a role open for director of partnerships EMEA, which is something I probably would have done a long time ago. But I thought, well, you know what? How could this go wrong? It can't, no. It's, it's, I could be at a startup. It could go horribly wrong, and I will have made myself busy for the year. Or I'll try it. So I submitted my resume, and Kurt Mumel, I don't know if you know any of the data acres, but he called me back, and I literally started working within two weeks. I couldn't ask for a better company. I have never had so much fun in my career. And it's funny because it's, I think a, a, another 10 years could pass now and I probably wouldn't want to take the time off. But it was completely happenstance that, that this happened. And um, I actually really enjoy working in France with startups and being able to provide feedback and insight into some of the history or knowledge I've had in uh, the Bay Area with other companies. So I kind of taken, have taken more of a position of coaching and saying, hey, I'm here. There are, excuse the expression, 30 ways to skin a cat. You don't need to do it just one way. What are your goals? What do we want to do as a company? OK, we can look to build it out and scale it out this way. And it's been great working with Data IQ because they have, obviously, other friends that are founders. And uh, they've brought them in and said, hey, Hillary, you want to catch up with them? I, and I love it. I absolutely love it. So long-winded answer, but there you go. A great answer, though, because it just shows that really it's about that you know, sort of getting deep into it and just being fascinated and curious and just you Truly feel like you're it. learning every day. Yeah. The other thing, so Hillary and I caught up earlier today, um, and she touched on the fact that she has horses. Do you want to share that habit? For the kids other like thing. So, <laughs> one of the things that I see a lot with founders is this concept of burnout, and, and Hillary mentioned it earlier, and, and she's figured out. So, for me, by the way, it's walking my dog. If I don't go on, on a walk with my dog every two or three days, by the way, I'm on day four of not seeing my dog, so just watch out. We're going for um, a walk tomorrow. We're going to go for a walk tomorrow. It's going to be fine. I'm just going to accost <laughs> people with their dogs whilst I'm out. Um, just it's my way of decompressing and giving my brain a break. Yours is horses, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, so it, it's interesting because um, if anyone were to ask me who I owe my greatest um, I know, owed to something or level of knowledge, it'd be my horses. Um, they have given me so much of a sense of self, um, humility, um, understanding how, understanding leadership, you, know, you can't tell a horse. You've got to like reverse psychology completely. So taking that approach, um, how others may view you. You know, I might have a really busy day at the office and I have just had a stinky attitude. And I go out to the field and they're like, oh no, no, turn around and walk away. So all of these are very simple things, but they really provided me insight and balance um, to understand, develop, and grow myself. 
Um, and in addition to that, uh, they allowed me an escape, an, an escape, a healthy one. I could jump on my horse's back and go ride 50 miles for the evening, and the next day just comes new. So I encourage everyone, whatever their passion is, maybe it's building model airplanes, I don't know, who knows. But whatever, whatever it is, do something radically different that just helps you exit from your day, and don't forget to do it. Because you know what? The next day is going to come. It's not all that urgent. Well, some things are urgent. But just step back, relax, and get into yourself. And horses help me. Whatever your thing is, it could be singing, it yeah. could be painting, it could be Karaoke. playing video games. It doesn't matter what it is, but just make sure you do it. Have a thing. Always have a thing. Yeah. Um, all right, a couple of more practical questions around you know, sort of how you approach business or, or how Data IQ approaches business. So you, we mentioned earlier that Data IQ has now gone into multiple markets. That proves or, or that brings extra challenges as well as obviously exciting expansion plans, which is fabulous. How on earth does this business work in terms of making sure that the whole of these different teams in different cities and different locations, where do you get the cohesiveness from? How do you make sure that you build that into the company DNA? The founders, um, all four of them are incredible human beings. And I think what they put first and foremost are the people in the organization. And I truly mean that coming from other organizations. I hear that, you know, you hear it from HR, you get that, that, uh, thing on the wall that says we love our people and then you feel it completely differently so I think that the founders hear their people and as we scale I think there's some sort of magic sauce that they look for um, in hiring uh, people they say hire you hear hire the best well what does the best mean there's some sort of innate characteristics that um, the founders have looked for originally and have kind of distilled that down into the hiring managers that has really allowed us to retain a corporate culture and its communication, its collaboration, its positivity. Um, you can have an A player who is great on paper, but they're just not a team player, maybe not the right, you know, you just don't want to have them on a team. They've been able to kind of discern that uh, and, and, and go for, is this person going to fit within this organization? And does this person communicate? How do they work? And kind of repeat that even as we scale. And they also are very good about structuring leadership. And not leadership to lead, but leadership to support. And leadership to be there to be able to hear the teams and hear the people across. And then go back and kind of um, consolidate those, those feedbacks. It's important to build that company culture. And from day one, though, isn't Incredible. it? It's not something that you can kind of as we've seen from some other companies say, I don't know, WeWork, Uber. Yeah. You, know, you can't retrofit it in, kids. You've got to put it in there from day one. There are standard and non-standard growing pains. And it's, I think it's hard to normalize those. I think that Data IQ has, had, has done an incredible job and continues to do uh, a kind of a gut check and normalizing on what's good. And at the end of the day, it's humans, it's people. So back to you know, your fascination with AI. We were talking earlier about you know, some of the challenges that, that come along with new technology, you know, it, new space, very exciting, but with that comes perhaps some issues and some bad stuff. So let's talk about ethics for a little oh while. Oh boy, that's a big one. We, how long has everyone got, by the way? I'm just checking now. I mean, we're busy. But from an ethics perspective, what do you think are some of the bigger issues that as a, you know, sort of as a technology community that we, we need to start thinking more about or need to care about more? Well, I think that um, ethics is, is paramount, and it's less um, platform, country, or industry specific, and we're moving to a time of global, truly globalization at the human level from everything that we see going on with governments through to um, you know, the large players in the industry and how they use AI, how they want it perceived, how Facebook and platforms operate, and we'd like to think that everyone is good. That's that they're all a player, but unfortunately, there are some characters that are probably suboptimal and may have alternate realities. And how do we make sure that that those are kept in their in a box per se? And I think that um, we need to figure out as a global community of leadership and organizations like Microsoft and Facebook, as well as governments, how to standardize on global policies and global boundaries. And not not I don't want to say boundaries, global norms. I say global norms and ethics. And I think at the end of the day, when I sit down with human beings uh, of every religion, every country, we're all pretty similar. We, we know what's generally on board and not. Um, how do we up-level that through to organizations, corporations, and governments? So I'd say overall, whether we have a current organization and we start to up-level that or create a new one, we need to think as one across the planet, if that makes sense. 
That's a big ass problem, That's isn't it? That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> and then one of the other things that's sort of bubbling under at the moment, I'm not sure if, uh, whether folks in the audience have seen this, um, Apple Card. The algorithm's broken, right? The, a guy can get significantly more credit on Apple Card, even though his partner, who has obviously the same access to the same wealth, will not get the same. So clearly the algorithm has been built incorrectly. We don't have enough women in positions to, or, or other underrepresented groups in these roles to be able to program the things that are powering our future. Do you think AI has the same issue? Oh my, that's a loaded question. I did it deliberately. How you just blindsided me, though. Um, I think any algorithm. How do you how do you check algorithms to the point where there's a point zero 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 one failure rate? Um, I think that's going to be difficult. I think that the more we have individuals um, from every background, um, every gender looking at it, they provide different approaches. And the more minds we have looking at constants and variables, I think the less error, margin of error, we'll, we'll see. And it, it, hopefully that's not too general. But um, you know, if you only have a group of five working on something, and they're, that's it, and they're going to take it to market, Hey, you know what? That might go sideways. But how do we um, how do we work together to cross check each other and have different human beings, men, women, whatever you identify with, mm -hmm. looking at that and bringing your perspective to help cross check that fabric? And I don't want to say blockchain ish, but I didn't say blockchain at all. <laughs> but kind of pervasive fabric. <laughs> I did give her a curveball question there, by the way. She wasn't Ow. prepared for that. No. Uh, all right. Here's here's did the I, one that you know you did perfectly okay. well. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Final question, which is one that we spoke about, don't worry. Um, we want to make sure that this is a super practical session and that people walk out of here at least kind of going, yeah, okay, I can see how I can apply that. So what would be your few words of advice, two or three things that you think everybody in the room could just, if they were either, you know, either they work for a startup or they perhaps want to become a founder and they have a passion that they want to follow, what would your words of advice be for founders in the room? Okay, this sounds really simplistic. I say this to myself every day, every week, every year. What's my point? Why am I doing, what's my point? And if I were to back into that with my career or with horses or as a founder, I would consistently and continually ask myself that question and gut check and also have um, a community or um, set of assets, people or or knowledge bases to, to do those gut checks and, and constantly kind of get that sounding and feedback. And uh, for founders and for companies, what are you bringing to the table? Ask yourself that. What are you bringing to the table? And it's not, oh great, I want to be a founder, I want to bring something to market. What is the value to customers? What are you helping other people solve? What are the pain points? Kind of reverse engineer it. Be super um, aware of what's in the market and what you're bringing to market and what your focus is. And again, it sounds so simple. What's your point? It's a great thing, though, to because if you, uh, we were talking about this earlier as well, back to the kind of elevator question, you know, can you say something really succinctly in a sentence that explains who you are and what you do? And my version of that is the mum test. If you can explain to somebody who perhaps isn't of your technical world who you are and what you do, so uh, this is my version of it, if I can explain it to my mum in a sentence and she understands it, then I'm like, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, have that ele elevator pitch, have that passion, feel it in your gut. And again, I know it's so, my mother's like, my gosh, that's just so blunt, Hillary. I'm like, well, what's your point? That <laughs> sounds like, no, just like listen to the words. <laughs> so that's, that's definitely. Do we have time for Q&A, Anthony, or are we going to roll straight into the next one? Rolling. We're rolling. We're rolling. All right. Thank you, Hillary. Say thank you, everybody. Thank you.